All right, so Brian Dickinson's in the house today. Uh, another uh, fun guest of ours on this wide variety of guests we have on Not For Long Media. Brian, how are you doing today? Doing great. Oh, thanks so, for having me on. I'm excited. So you're in Seattle? Yep, pretty much. Just 25 miles east, a place called Snoqualmie. That's wonderful. The uh, are you a are you a hockey fan by chance? <laughs> the Kraken. The Kraken. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, people are pretty pumped around here. Um, yeah, not, they're, they're marketing not the super fan. They're marketing the crap out of it. And, yeah. Uh, well, the name yeah, like had, the Kraken. The Kraken, right? Seattle. They. I'm a hockey fan, and, and they and the. Uh, it's fun. It seems like a great thing. I know the season mm -hmm. tickets sold out right away, and Seattle's a great sports city. So, um, you know, obviously they do well. So first off. Um, thank you for your service. Six years in the United States Navy. Uh, that's quite, that's quite, quite some time here. I don't, you know, you can't always trust Google, but, um, special mm -hmm. operations, uh, air rescue swimmer. Is that true? Yep. That's awesome. So how do you get a passion for getting into the Navy and, and getting to work in academies? Um, I think just a, a family of Navy and military, you know, probably had its toll. Um, I honestly, as a kid, I, I don't think I wanted to go in the military. Probably just wanted to play soccer and, you know, just get a full ride somewhere and, you know, did well there and um, had opportunities. But, you know, when it came down to it, I just I didn't want to just roll right into more school. I wanted to go see the world, do some adventures and kind of kick it up a notch. So, yeah, as an aviation rescue swimmer, it's pretty tough training. We, you know, we used to jump out of helicopters and rescue people in trouble. So, yeah, it was a fun job for my 20s. And that is not. It, it sounds like I have some friends in the Coast Guard. I'm in Cape May. It's a big Coast Guard community. It's is it? It's not the Coast Guard, obviously. It's the Navy, but mm -hmm. yeah, sounds sounds uh, very, very similar. It, it is very similar. In fact, one of our instructors was a Coast Guard swimmer, and we had a, a few coasties that went through. So there's some overlap. Um, our our jobs are just a little bit different. You know, they're protecting the coast, and we'll do some of that. But you know, we're worldwide. You know, we're flying circles around the aircraft carrier you know, picking up down pilots or dropping off Navy SEALs in dangerous zones and giving them aerial support, you know, as an aerial gunner and combat search and rescue. So a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds fun. You mentioned your soccer career. Uh, where did that take you? And, and, you know, what, what was that like growing up for you playing soccer? And, and what, what were your goals with that? <laughs> goals, no pun. Yeah. Um, uh, so I did well as all state, you know, I grew up in a really small town. I think we're the first and only team to take the the little town to state. So there's, there's that, but, you know, paused on that, went in the Navy, but then I ended up playing on a Navy soccer team. And actually a week before I was getting out, I snapped my ACL. So I actually had to, on a, in a, in a game we were playing and uh, had to extend a full year for surgery and, you know, be fit for duty before they'd release me. Yeah, I was going to um, say, how did that hold up your Navy crew, your Navy? <laughs> Not so well. I can't really, you know, rescue people in the middle of the ocean if my knee's twisting the wrong way. Um, but, you know, have two kids now and coach them, you know, throughout and play some indoor and different things. But, you know, just kind of pivoted my my career of soccer to more to the mountains. Did you enlist or did you go through um, Annapolis? I think that's the correct terminology for it. Annapolis, yeah, that's the academy. No, nope, guys enlisted. Enlisted, yeah. Yep. Uh, so you did it the real way, we say. I'm, uh, Captain Ken, who will come on here, he, he's a fighter pilot. And, um, oh, nice. Uh, for, let's see, 20 years, he Persian Gulf and a bunch of different things he was in. So he flew F-18s and, yep. uh, yeah, his son, my, my cousin Rob, he enlisted. He says he did it the real way. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, his dad yeah. went to the academy. Um, so you mentioned you went into climbing. Um, and that's, you know, it's become not who you are, but, but really, you know, what you're known for, you've been all mm -hmm. over, um, CNN, ABC, you name it, right. I'm sure Fox, uh, you've been all over and you're known mm -hmm. for, for soloing the summit of Mount Everest. And you've also did the seven summits, which is, you know, you've climbed all seven peaks of all seven continents, um, in our world, which is just unbelievable. Before we get into all that, We'll start at, we'll start at the ground level, right? You, you, you leave the Navy and then you're transferred into climbing. How does that happen? Yeah, right. Just unlucky, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my wife and I, we we met, we we're, I was stationed in San Diego. So we met down there and, you know, just in our twenties growing up together, you know, in your twenties, you really have to kind of define who you are. And if you get in a serious relationship, you know, that's, 
that can be a challenge in itself. That's, you know, that's our early days, Everest that we were climbing. So after six years of dating, we got married and decided to move up to the Pacific Northwest to go to grad school. And we we're getting our master's degrees and there's a lot of mountains out here. And I just started climbing, started climbing Rainier and, you know, training on, you know, the highest glaciated peak in the lower 48 and decided to kick it up a notch and climb the highest peaks on the seven continents. You wake up one day and say, I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to start climbing these because is it, is it the competitive driving you? Is it, is that stemming from your athletic career? Is that stemming from the Navy? Is that stemming from going to grad school? Where does that stem from? Yeah, I think we're all wired differently and I'm sure you're very similar. I mean, you're just, you're a goal setter. You, you want to, you don't want to just kind of float through life. Like you have one shot at this life. So you might as I well. I think my, our shrink, my, we had my shrink coach, sorry, from Carolina on last week. He was saying I was addicted to, I'm addicted to achieving. I just constantly want to achieve wherever that may be. I thought that was interesting. I never heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be dangerous too. Right. So, yeah. you know, anything in moderation. And I think I've learned a lot of that throughout the years, you know, because you can just keep after it. And then if you're continually going after it, something has to give, whether that's family or, you know, even health and that, you know, anything overly healthy can be unhealthy. So you're, you're ready to roar, you know, you're, you're done with the Pacific Northwest. You're ready to climb the seven summits and you start with which one? Um, first one. Yeah. So the first one that's interesting was Denali up in Alaska and got a thousand feet from the top. And because of weather, you know, we had to turn back. So the first one I did not, you know, succeed. I mean, defines succeeding, getting down safely is good. In fact, it was, it was so bad up there. I mean, we were pinned down at high camp, 17,000 feet for a week. It was so cold. You could actually see your breath freezing. So I'm sitting there just going, man, what am I doing? This is stupid. And then some guy not in our group decided to go for the summit, you know, in the storm and he got blown off. They still haven't found him. So on our summit attempt, we went up, we were searching for him. The C-130s are flying with their infrared looking. They, as far as I know, they still haven't found his body. So, so you know, we, we got up pretty, pretty high, pretty close to the summit and it was just a good day to live. And we turned around and, you know, packed it out. I love that. It's a good day to live for sure. So when you're, you said you're grounded for a week and it's so cold and the weather's so poor, I'm, I'm guessing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are you eating? How are you surviving? Take us into those moments. Yeah, it's, it's a suffer fest. It's um, you're not hungry at altitude. Your body's just going through some funky stuff and you have to force the food down. And it's, it's tough because you're trying to melt blocks of ice to make hot water to, to boil your, um, freeze-dried dinners and stuff and you know they're just nasty over time and you know you're losing a ton of weight up there too because there's not as much oxygen you know there's not enough air up there so your body's working twice or three times as hard so it's it's miserable but you just got to do it it's not like you can just step out of your tent and like run home it's like you're you're committed when you know it's 70 mile an hour winds and it's freezing it's minus 40 it's like yeah you're you're pretty much hunkering down yeah you're there that's that's incredible so you make it down safely and then you're on to, I guess we could go all, if you want to go through all seven, that would be, that would be fantastic. What was number two? Can you go through them all? Yeah. Yeah. So that was, oh, that was 2009 was Denali. And then, and I ended up trying it two more times, snowboarded it once just throughout the years. Um, but the next year I did both Kilimanjaro in Africa and Mount Elbrus, the highest peak in Europe, which is in Russia and had my wife go up to like high camp or base camp with me. So that was kind of cool to have her involved. And all of these, I always made it a, uh, a part of my climbs was to bring um, toys to orphanages. So I was always doing these drives. And then either before or after the climb, I'd go and visit an orphanage and give out some toys and stuff. It's kind of cool. How did that come to fruition? How did you think of that idea? Um, I don't know. It's just, I, I think I just, I knew climbing in itself was kind of more about just me and my goal setting. And if I'm going to put all this effort into it, why not try to do like a, you know, a minor good for the world. Not, you know, I don't know how much good that does, but I know in that moment, those kids realize, you know, when, you know, everyone else is pretty much neglected on someone out there cared. Yeah. No doubt about it. So you're three mountains in, uh, yep. Alaska, Kilimanjaro, and then one was, where was it again? I'm sorry. In Russia. In Russia. So are there different, obviously there's different attack plans for all of these places. And we'll talk through the different mountains and Again, what you're quote unquote really known for. 
uh, publicly known for what, what you got a lot of notoriety for uh, rightfully so like for these first couple mountains here like what are the plans are you meeting with people that you're going up with or uh, are you zooming how how is this happening <laughs> um yeah zoom didn't exist yeah back then um no it was a uh, it wasn't like the same people that I climbed with. Um, Kilimanjaro is kind of just a, a cool experience. I had a couple of buddies from high school, one that went in the Navy with me as well. And we just met up and did that together. Um, but Elbrus was just friends. Um, Denali, I didn't know anyone. Just met up with a team over there. So that was like I, one of the one and only guided trips that I did. Yeah. And then uh, in 2011, went to Everest. Wow. So you go to Everest and, you know, you soloed from the summit of Mount Everest, you know, the, the whole story about the Sherpa who got sick and had to leave and then you had to finish, but take us back to going to Everest, take us back to, um, you know, your pregame thoughts, what it takes, take us into the details, I guess, of, of what's at the bottom of the mountain. You get there a couple of days before the preparation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lifestyle. You know, it's playing in the NFL. It's not like you just show up and you're going to just, you know, kick ass out there. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. No. Um, on Everest, you just show up, you're going to die. And even if you're totally fit and it is a lifestyle, there's, you know, there's a lot of risk involved. So it really is a lifestyle. Like, you know, back home, I'm, I'm waking up five in the morning, you know, 60, 70 pounds and doing like a four or 5,000 foot peak, you know, maybe eight to 10 miles. And that's just a daily routine, a lot of cross training as well, but also fitness, mental, spiritual, because physically, like you probably know, you definitely know physically, people can usually reach a certain level, but it's that mental toughness, that grit is what keeps you there. Because when things aren't going right, it's easy to just turn around. Like, yeah, no, yeah, it, it won't. They will guarantee they, you know, that's the one consistent things will not say the same, you know, and go right. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Especially on a mountain. Like there's right. no... Like you said, this isn't like, hey, guys, you know, cut, we're rolling, kill the video, we're heading back. This is like, I'm a week pinned to the whatever, take base right. camp here, and I'm miserable. Um, but the Mount Everest process, like, you're there a couple of days before, you're getting settled in, how's that go? Uh, so, so the entire climb of Everest takes two months. So Mount Everest is at 29,000 feet, same altitude that major jet airliners cruise at. So there's only a third of the air, third of the ozone up there. So if you were to pluck your body from where you're at in North Carolina, put you up on the summit, you'd pass out and die. You just, you can't survive. So that first month, the first 10 days is just getting to base camp. Base camp's at 17,500 feet and it's 38 miles on foot. So you're cruising in, you're immersed with the Sherpa, the local people there. They're helping carry some gear with yaks, you know, carrying your stuff and, Staying in the villages, I mean, that that alone is just amazing. Like, I recommend that to everyone. Most people can survive that. So but you're saying you just go there and just, like, walk up, a, you know, the first <laughs> eighth of the mountain and just go to these villages and see that? Is that what you're trying to – is that what you're saying? So just to get to base camp, so the base of Everest. Yeah. That that portion. So 38 then, miles. Yeah, there's – yeah, well, just – okay, just go to the first village. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just fly into that village. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a life changer because you're in the highest peaks in the world. So you're you're already higher than you'd ever be in the US. And you're looking up and peaks are just massive. It's just it's mind blowing. It's hard. In to these process. villages, it's like running water, you know, families like what is this? Yeah, it's it's very um, it's not where we're used to here in the States. Yeah, I'll tell you that much. A lot of squatter toilets uh, a lot of um using yak dung for fuel to you know so the food food handling everything so you have to be really careful because you can get sick really quick and you're at altitude so you're not going to be getting better quick you got to go back down to lower altitude so there's there's a lot of ri at risk besides just the mountain itself wow that's 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 incredible so you're working your way up you get to base camp now what Right. So the whole acclimatization is where you are climbing up to the different camps on Everest at the different altitudes, basically touching a camp, go up to from 17,000 up to like 19, camp one, and then come back down. What that does is it forces your body to produce more red blood cells, which carry more oxygen so you can survive higher up. 
So that's why the process takes so long. It takes a month. You go up camp one, go spend five days back at base camp, head up to camp two, and then back down. And I don't know if you know much about Everest, but right out of base camp is the Kumbu Icefall. So it's these building-sized blocks of ice that are continually falling. So that's where you see the ladders that you're crossing. You know, you got your crampons, the spikes on your boots and all your gear, crossing these ladders over these, you know, bottomless crevasses. So yeah, I ended up going through that about eight times, just up and down, acclimating until about a month into it, finally reached camp three at 23,000 feet, which is halfway up the fourth highest mountain in the world called Lotse. So it's just this straight up ice and rock climb and you anchor the tents off, they're all tied off and bring it all the way back down and then wait for a, like a five day weather window because that's how long it's gonna take to get back up there and then up to high camp and then to the summit. How are you figuring out this weather window? Someone pulling up the old, uh, you know, Verizon wireless cell phone up there and checking, <laughs> checking on the. It checking might be the... nowadays. I don't know. This yeah. is ten years ago. Um, when when I was there, we were calling um, like Sweden and Seattle, triangulating all the weather. And on Everest, it's very predictable because it's so high; it creates its own weather patterns. But there's monsoon season, and there's a handful of days, usually in May that you can actually summit where it's gonna calm down just enough to get in. So that's why you see like on the news, you see like a major traffic jam and that's, they're all trying to wedge in there because there's only one way up, one way down. Um, I was fortunate in my experience because that was not the case. I was totally alone. Yeah, the traffic jam. Touch on that for a second. Cause I remember seeing that, when did I see that last? That was like a, that was maybe a couple of years ago, a year or two, two, year or two ago, there was just people like, waiting and then people were dying because they couldn't summon, et cetera. What, what was that about? Yeah, that's no, unfortunate. I, I feel fortunate I wasn't in that type yeah. of scenario, but if you have so many people in a position to summit and you get one weather window, you know, everyone's going to be forced down that, you know, up one route and coming down that same route. So you're kind of trying to like interchange between each other. And I know when I was going up Lotse Face up to Camp 3, there was a, a group from India. Like I had to go, they were just stopped. And I'm trying to like get around them. And I, I had to like literally check to see if they were alive. And they were, they just kind of looked up at me. They were just dealing with altitude. You know, they weren't fully acclimated. They were doing their thing, which is totally fine. But I just kind of clipped, I had two clips around them. So there's these fixed lines, ropes that are attached to anchor points. So if I fall, I only fall to the next anchor point. So clipped around there and kept cruising up. And it was, you know, an hour or so later, they finally showed up at camp. They were pretty wasted. But, and it's, you know, everyone's, you know, everyone's body is different. They're dealing with the altitude. So, you know, I'm not, not here to judge, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go back down, right, when you're getting back and you're going through the acclimation process, what are you doing at these camps? Does like sleeping a ton? You're just exhausted? What, yeah. So there was a... Through? There was a cell tower, like a line of sight cell tower. So I had like a Nepalese cell phone. So I'd go down there and, you know, try to do some like video feeds, and, you know, with the 2011 technology and um, call my wife, call my kids, you know, and just re read books and then see if anyone had any other books I could read. And <laughs> just, just there's a lot of downtime. And that's, that's one of the toughest, that was one of the toughest things for me. I have a great life at home. I have great great wife and kids and leaving them, you know, cause they were young, I think like five and eight back then, maybe even younger. And that was tough. And I had to like, just mentally just keep pushing through because I so wanted to just pack it up and just be like, this ain't worth it. You know, two months out of their lives, just not worth it. But had many conversations. My wife's like, you're there, you've trained for this, you know, just do yeah, it. Just do it. All right. So we're working our way up. You get to, was it base three, you were saying, and camp three. yeah, camp three, sorry. Mm -hmm. And now what? So yeah, we can go to my summit day. So it was May 14th, 2011. Um, and this is where you start using supplemental oxygen. So it's, it's basically, um, you know, 15 pound tank, maybe carrying two of those. So I don't know if it outweighs the benefits, but yeah, it'll definitely keep you alive. It mixes with the outside air. So it's not like scuba diving because if you came off that, you'd just die. Yeah. 
Um, so that's where I started with that, was heading up Load Safe Face and got about, I don't know, a thousand or so feet up above camp. And it, it was 70 mile an hour winds. It was just this insane, you know, we we're trying to hit this window for May 15th where things were supposed to die down. I um, had to get up to high camp, which is in the death zone, 26,000 feet. And that's where there's a third of the air, a third of the ozone. Like if you cut your finger, it won't heal. Like it's literally the death zone. You are dying. Um, but I got a thousand feet above camp and was getting some water. And I had to take my system off, you know, so I'm basically on the side of a wall of ice um, connected to the rope. I take my mat off so I could, you know, feed myself some water. And my foot slipped out and I had goggles wrapped around my, my arm and they slid off and my goggles just, they fell down the mountain and I'm like, oh crap, you know, and they, they went probably about 500 feet down and some Sherpa that were coming up to a higher camp three actually were waving at me. They, they got them, they tied them to the fixed line, the rope. So I left my bag, my oxygen, everything I rappelled down, got to them and they were cracked. So goggles have two lenses, internal, external, and the internal was cracked. So they were like freezing between layers. So I ended up ripping the internal lens out, you know, not really realizing that it would cut their effectiveness in half. So anyways, continued moving up high winds and eventually got to high camp. And it was just myself and Pasong, who's a Sherpa friend. And we just kind of relaxed. We made our calls, checked the weather. And, uh, you know, later that night, we we're going to go for the summit. Yeah. So you're going for the summit and he gets sick of all people to get sick yeah he's human <laughs> yeah right i mean that's that's like um tom brady you know getting sick he probably you know he you know he's a different he doesn't get sick i guess he's just tom no, brady no. <laughs> no, but he get sick. So, yeah so your sherpa gets ill and then he decides he has to go down the mountain he's that significantly ill again this is the death death stone like you're saying there's no it's you're yeah. miserable yeah he's he's a strong guy young guy he's had um, two other summits prior to this, and he's since had more. Um, but yeah, we got up to 28,000 feet, and we are the only two people going for the summit from either side. So you can climb from the south out of Nepal or the north out of Tibet. So it's very unusual. So we just hit this window, and we both felt really comfortable. The weather was good, um, but he just he wasn't feeling well. So at about 28,000 feet, he's just like, I need to go. You know, he's going to wait pretty close to where we were at, not go all the way to high camp. Um, but he left an extra oxygen bottle. You know, we had that conversation, made sure he was good. He made sure I was good. And, you know, you live and die by decisions. And he turned down, I went up and he ended up going all the way down to high camp. So, you know, he wasn't feeling well, he had to do what he had to do. But I didn't overthink it. I just continued up. And first major obstacle, it's this rock climb, which you know, in sea level, it'd be nothing, but at, you know, in the death zone at 28,000 feet, it's, it's some effort. Um, the sun was rising. So I got up over the South summit and it drops back down and got over Hillary step, which is a 40 foot rock climb. And then the, you can see the summit from there. And the last section, it's called the Cornice Traverse. It's about two feet wide and it's two miles straight down into Tibet, into the right and two miles straight down into Nepal to the left. So it's this very narrow, you know, zero margin of error type of situation. So got across that and eventually pierced my crampons on the summit. And you're not clipped in going across that two feet. Yeah, there's, there's fixed lines. Okay, so, I was gonna say 70 mile an hour winds. <laughs> yeah, no, so 70 was the day prior. Okay, and so got it. Yeah, so how Everest works is usually the, the winds die down through the night and on any highly glaciated mountain, you actually climb through the night because once the sun comes up, things become very unstable. Yeah. So you want to, you know, use your gear to its best. So you want, actually want to reach a summit when the sun is rising around there and then get down, you know, pretty efficiently. So that's what I was doing. Wow. So you, you make it. I you're made at, it. You're at the top. Yeah. And it was it was a, is a lot. And it's actually, you know, 10 years later, it's, it's a lot to process because yeah. getting to the summit of Everest is one thing, right? Like who does that? You know, there's, there's a few people that have, but you know, mass majority of people will never even consider it. They may go watch the movie, 
Um, but to do it on my own, you know, according to the Himalayan database, I'm like one of two people to ever have had the summit to myself on a given day. So clearly didn't intend to do that, but life happens. Yeah, life happens. So you're up there. You have some time to yourself to process, think things through, be where your feet are and take it all in. Yeah, you try. But with a third of the air, it's things are moving fast. And I knew I had to get down. So I took some selfies, highest selfie in the world, took some, you know, video till my camera froze and then made a radio call down, let everyone know I made it. And, and that's the point where I actually had a friend who was one camp below. He was heading up to high camp, making his summit attempt. He and his uh, um, Sherpa, Lakpa. And that's the first that anyone knew that I was alone. And the radio call was pretty simple because he was like, you know, be careful, you and Pasong on your way down. And I said, well, that's cool, but I'm alone. He's like, what happened to Pasong? Like he's, he went down, he's waiting for me. It's like, man, okay, well, be careful. And he talked to Lakpa after that. We had been climbing for the last month together. And he's like, how long will it take Brian to get down? He's like, Brian, probably two to three hours. And nobody would hear from me for seven. Wow. So no one hears from you seven. Why? Well, that's where the story yep. turns. For so the road, I, the road. it's crazy. Yeah. So I've, you know, you only have so much time up there, maybe an hour to really just take it in and, you know, it's see the curvature of the world and, and just being, you know, there's no person higher at that moment. It's, it's, it, I don't know. It's a lot to take in. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. Um, but I started heading down and within, you know, five, 10 feet, everything just went completely white. And I, I just remember just dropping down, grabbing the rope that I was connected to and just assessing the situation. It's like, I realized I went snow blind. Yeah. So I'm completely blind, completely alone. Nobody's coming to get me. And I just remember standing up and moving like I have to get down. So I was at that point, just really forced to use my senses, but I was really trying to use my eyes. I'm not usually blind. Um, you ever been snow blind? No, I'm not. Yeah. I don't recommend it. It's usually it takes about 24 hours to return. I wouldn't regain my eyesight for about a month and a half. Wow. So you were blind for a month and a half. So yeah. you went down the whole mountain. I mean, we, that's, that's the moral to the story. And I, I want to walk us through. So you're blind for the month and a half. You, you went down the mountain. Spoiler alert, you're sitting here today. We're talking. But, okay, I don't even know where to start. The trials and tribulations are through the roof, right? But what, what are your, what's the self-talk going between the years there? Because there's got to be a lot of it, right? Family, kids, you just made it. You just had a massive achievement that not even 1% of the 1% of the 1% have done, even less percentage of that. And now you're blind after you said the greatest achievement of your life, what's going through your head? Obviously there's some panic, but, but it has to be under control. Cause you know, based off oxygen, you got to get back down. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. So um, I'm actually writing a second book right now and it's about this moment right here. Why didn't I panic? Panic kills. So what I did in the military as an aviation rescue swimmer, we were trained to be calm in the chaos under every circumstance and a lot of that came back. So I didn't panic. I got up and I started moving. And through faith and focus, I just continually moved. I just kept my faith. I knew there was a high percentage that I wasn't going to make it. But I never once thought about that. I just, I kept moving. And I just, ironically, I couldn't focus because I couldn't see anything. But I was just trying to focus on taking that next step feeling the rope, coming in and out of the anchor points, getting into the right rope. So the, the ropes up there are left for years. If you snap into the wrong rope, it's brittle. You break, you die, you, you know, you fall for two miles. So it's really just a really timely process, you know, having to get water, um, went down. Well, first was that two mile traverse, you know, the Cornus Traverse. In the high winds, 50 mile an hour gusts, I could hear them now coming up and over the ridge and I would hunker down, let it go over me and I'd get up, take another step. And this whole time, I just, I felt this presence around me. It's like, if you close your eyes, you know, I'm in the room with you. It's just this 
presence that I didn't overthink, think too much about. It's just, it was always there the entire walk down. And I just, I just kept moving. I got to um, Hillary's step and I had to reverse my gear and kind of rappel down this 40 foot rock face. And I remember just kind of pendulum slipped out, slammed against the rock and just slid down, but, you know, did a self-assessment. Like I was, I wasn't broken as far as I could tell and just got up, started moving again, had to climb up the South summit because you actually dipped down and on the top of that just slipped out, just took a major fall. And I remember that was probably the scariest, well, one of two scariest moments. I mean, go on your roof, close your eyes and jump off. It's kind of that helplessness until the rope that I was attached to shock loaded. So didn't pull the anchor out. I'm upside down. Mask is ripped from my face. Oxygen bottles coming out. And I remember just my heart just ripping out of my chest and just I had to like stop and just control my breathing. Just calm down because that alone will kill you. You know, you get into those panic modes and then up there, you're in the death zone. You just close your eyes and you peacefully fall asleep. So I righted myself, you know, got down to where Pasong had turned around. And I almost walked right past the oxygen bottle that he had left. So a spare bottle. And it was just kind of this bright orange thing glowing. So with snow blindness, it's not black. Everything is bright white. Like if you put a light bulb in front of your face, and put your finger in front of it, you'd know something moved, but there's no way you can actually see it. And it's just very, very painful, like scratching in your eyelids. But I saw this bright orange thing, and I remember laying down next to it, pulling my regulator off, trying to make that thing work, and it just it wouldn't work for whatever reason. So I put my old oxygen back on. I knew it was going to be out soon. And I, for whatever reason, I don't know, I grabbed the other oxygen bottle and put it in my pack. It's like I didn't want to litter or something. I have no clue. Just focused on getting down. Got to the balcony where Pasong was supposed to be, and he wasn't there. Um, but I remember being happy. I made it like halfway down. The rest was like 20 pitches, maybe like a mile of rappelling. Um, but it would lead straight into high camp. And got a little snack, got some water, started heading down, and maybe 20 feet into it, my mask just collapses around my face. And I ran out of oxygen. And I remember at that moment, I'd been climbing for over 30 hours since the day prior to this point, you know, completely blind, just wrecked. And I just remember running out of oxygen, which is usually pretty instant death. I just dropped to my knees and prayed. And it's very simple. Just, God, I can't do this on my own. Please help. And immediately just felt this energy come over me. And just had this life in me. And first thing I did is I fumbled around, tried that extra oxygen bottle and got a positive flow. And I remember taking like five deep breaths and just, it was like fire. Like I'd never felt this, like air was like fire burning through my veins. And I, I had life. And again, I just put all my gear back on, reversed it and just started in slow motion, but repelling down, just getting, going in the right direction. And eventually made it to the last quarter mile, this ice bulge, and out of nowhere, Pasong just hugs me. He's like, Brian, you alive. Never saw him coming. And he's like, I'm so sorry. I leave you. And I'm like, oh, don't worry about it, dude. <laughs> like, we're good. Wow. And uh, we, uh, he helped me back into camp. I passed out for like 15 hours. My eyes were glued shut, black eyes, lost 20 pounds. Um, still had to get down. It's still two days to get down the mountain. And then another two days to get, you know, to an area where I could fly into Kathmandu and home. But I was alive. Wow. Yeah, that's unprofessional of me. I'm not. I'm. I'm supposed to be dialed in here, but I'm so glued into your story. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, fantastic. You're. That's just unbelievable. You know, the will. You talked about your moment with 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 God. You talked about just so many different things that that are just. It's very inspirational and it's crazy. The fire, you're talking about the fire, breathing in that air and breathing in that oxygen, breathing in that life. I just can't imagine that, that, that sense of confidence that you had already that aura you said that was kind of around you and that confidence to take you. And then you're talking about free falling and just being like, here's jumping off your roof and you're going to see what happens when you hit the other side. I mean, that's, and it's out of your control. Yeah. 
it's powerless, which is extremely challenging when all the preparation you've done, all the different things that you've tried to control what you control and the rest is what is what, is what it's going to be. And then your sharper you know, gives you a huge hug. I mean, take us back into that moment. Like, are you just like wandering around and all of a sudden like bang, here he comes? Like that's got to be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it was there. There was a moment there. Because once I got down to kind of the flatter area, it's still, I guess, relatively flat. It's not not a straight down wall that I was going down at that point. Um, I I would stop a lot and be just trying so hard to stare and just find something and like these blurry things I thought were people and they'd end up being rocks. And at some point I thought I actually maybe had died. And like, is it like, am I dead right now? And it wasn't far after that is when Pasong just hugged me. Oh, wow. It was very, very powerful, powerful in that my friend that was down and he was moving up to the high camp. He was, he knew he hadn't heard from me in seven hours, he and his Sherpa, and they were just watching the mountain just for anything. Cause we were the only, I was the only person up there. If there was any movement, it was me and just not seeing anything. And then getting his, you know, he recalled it after like, yeah, we saw some movement there. And just, he was just so happy to see me yeah. alive. He didn't want to have to tell my wife. <laughs> it's not a good conversation. No, it's not a good conversation to have. Um, so, okay. So you back to base camp, you're working your way down the mountain. Everything went smoothly from there because you had some people around you to help you through things. Or you were just were like, I want to be on myself because I just did it by myself. I, you know, I <laughs> no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, no ego here. Like, Well, let's go back. Hold on. So you're 15 hours. I sealed shut. Yeah. Ex exhausted, tired, black eyes, beat to crap. You yeah. climbed how many straight hours to get down? You From, say, you say, you say we just climbed 30 straight hours. Is that true? Yeah. It was like 33, 35 hours to, from camp three summit down to high camp. Okay. So you're high camp. You're just passed out. Yeah. I was out. You wake up. Yeah. I kept waking up and ripping my eyes open. I didn't realize I was doing it, but and I, I had like the big cannon camera and I was taking selfies I have no idea but I, I checked the film later I'm like oh my gosh it's disturbing wow so you wake up and then and then what's up hey we got to keep we got to keep descending yeah you got to keep moving still in the death zone got to get down and it's no easy feat I mean that's going across ladders now you know it's one getting down low say face but then getting to camp two there's major crevasses and ladders to get through the kumbu icefall um, fixed line for a lot of it. So, you know, it had people around at least, but not a lot of help. It's just people were nearby. So if I needed anything, so I was upright, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing, just kept gravity working its thing. And eventually yeah, I got down there. I actually called my wife. I had a friend who had a sat phone at camp two and called her first time I got to talk to her. She had already heard that I summited. She had no idea what the heck I was up to. And I told her, I'm like, you know, there's always a delay on satellite phones. I'm like, Joanna, just hold on. And I'm totally crying. I'm like I summited, I soloed and I'm blind. And then the thing cut out and I couldn't get her back. And so I own, <laughs> I own the worst phone calls of a spouse in history. It's not a good thing to own. No, that's not a good thing to own. That's not... <laughs> No, that's definitely something as a new newly married man that I'm not, uh, I don't plan on having, no. um, uh, but Hey, life happens, especially when you're climbing Mount Everest or descending Mount Everest, I guess at that point. Yeah. All right. So we were working to the bottom of the mountain. Everything went somewhat smoothly compared to what it was at the top of the mountain coming down. Yeah. I mean, it, there was nothing graceful about getting across those ladders, you know, yeah. I'm, be, before I'm like, I could just run across, you know, I'm clipped in. So if I fall, I'm going to fall, the rope will catch me. But I was, I was still clipped in, but I was hands and hands crawling. There's nothing beautiful about that, but, uh, you know, yeah. safety first. But yeah, I got in. Sherpa down at base camp had made a summit cake for me, which was nice of them and pretty much packed up. I talked to my wife for about an hour, had the cell phones. So I was able to tell her the whole story and, and then pretty much packed it out. Started heading out two more days where I was on a flight to Kathmandu and then Thailand and back home. Someone's got to walk you to the airport now, though. Like, there's no like, you can't just resume normal life. 
for that time period? No, because you said it was seven weeks. So how did that process go? Yeah, it was tough. So my, uh, my right eye started coming back a little more. So it was like, if you blur your eyes, that's probably as good as it was. Uh, my left was super jacked. Um, but I was alone in like Thailand and Thai people are a little bit shorter than me. And I, I felt so bad. I'm just bumping into everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. And walking around trying to get some Thai food and you know, just tell the taxi where to take me. It was, it was rough. And just seeing myself, what I could, you know, barely see in a mirror because I hadn't looked at myself in months. So I, I looked pretty bad. Not that I look good normally, but I look <laughs> worse. You look that. great. You're doing fine. No, you're doing fine, Dad. You look good. Um, so okay, so a lot to take in there. And then that was only what? Was that summit four? Or mm -hmm. that was summit four? So then you had to attack three more. Uh, yeah. any major any what was the biggest hurdle out of those three? Um well, yeah, nothing compares. So later that year, so it's interesting because you get back and it's like, am I ever gonna climb again? Will I be permanently blind? And, you know, tons of PTSD, you know, just sitting on the floor in the, in the shower crying and like, how'd I get here? Um, wow. You know, just different, different things that would just like take me back, like never when I'm expecting it, you know, even now, you know, cause I do a lot of motivational talks and it's, it's hard to get through certain parts. Um, but getting out in the mountains was actually the most therapeutic thing that I could do getting out and leading. So later that year, I went down to Antarctica, climbed the highest peak there. Did some time like in Chile, climbing in Torres del Paine and um, the beautiful mountain, Vincent Massif down in Antarctica. It's, it was negative 70 on the summit. So that was a little chilly, um, but just amazing. It's like being on the moon. It's like no one just shows up in Antarctica, like you're there for a purpose. Yeah. So that's cool. about it. Yeah. That, I guess just, your wife's helping you through the process when you're finishing up with the, you know, coming down off of, we'll go back to finishing up Everest, uh, Everest. Mm -hmm. Your wife's there, you know, your, your kids were younger or born yet. Yeah. They're um, younger. So like first yeah. grade and probably kindergarten. Yeah. So they don't know what's going on in the sense that what you're going through, you know, and, and that's just. Well, yeah. And I get back and the, you know, the spotlight's on, you know, I got, Fox news in my house. I got, you know, I'm giving talks and, you know, all kinds of media and I uh, met up with my literary agent and then there's a book and potential movie, you know, like everything just kind of spans I'm like, Whoa, pump yeah. the brakes here. Let's uh, <laughs> I'm trying to deal with some stuff here. Yeah. You're trying to deal with coming down from the mountain figuratively and like literally like, oh. so, okay. So the TV and all that stuff gets involved. Um, this is before the, the seven, the finishing of the seven, seven summits. Obviously, it probably was always there even after. Where does that go? There's a series, there's a book, there's so many different things. Where does that go? Movie, possibly? How does that happen? Yeah. So Climbing Magazine was following me along my journey. So I, I had a lot documented. They're blogging with me. And uh, I met with my literary agent out of Franklin, Tennessee. And they connected me with speakers bureaus and Sony Pictures and stuff. I'm like, let's start with a book. Like, uh, I think there's, there's something that may be able to help others, you know, hopefully no one goes snow blind on Everest, but you know, there's everyone's dealing with an Everest and their own blind descent, which is the name of the book. Um, so wrote the book and, you know, took a few years to actually get published, you know, through Tyndale house and, you know, that opened the door for a lot more talks. I was already doing some motivational speaking, but that opened the door for that. So it's, been a, a crazy blessing you know I've never been like on stage doing this type of thing it's not a direction I was ever considering in my life but it's it's amazing when you can have that impact on just yeah. you know there's so many people that are just struggling in their own world my wife is a counselor so you know she sees it kind of on this micro level and I've been able to you know kind of more on the macro level yeah Wow, what a team you guys make. <laughs> talk about some real world, real world experiences. She could diagnose what it is and you can talk about exactly, you know, and I'm sure she can too, but your experiences are just, they're really moving. Um, for me and us here, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, we'll finish up with a few, few things for me. So uh, motivational speaking wise, you've probably met some unbelievable people over the years uh, in your travels, places, maybe speak about, talk about some things that 
first off, let's say this. What's a place that you, you spoke to or at where you're like, wow, I, I can't believe I'm speaking to this group. Or can you say that publicly? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no, it's, it's been arranged. So, I mean, that's been a blessing in itself. But I'd say that the coolest thing is there's an element of faith in my survival that I can't take credit for. And nor will I ever. You know, I've definitely called it out in the book. And I think the, the, the coolest thing is I've been in front of Microsoft, Cisco Systems, like these large companies, and never have to shy away from that. You know, it's been, no one's ever said, oh, gosh, don't talk about Jesus. <laughs> you know, it's like, if they tell me that, I'm not going to do it, right? But also just even politically, like having like a, a bipartisan group that was at here in Snoqualmie Falls, like this big... Uh, touristy place, but they were just in from all the different states, both Democratic, Republican, and just to be able to have a story that just forget your differences right now. Like here's here's a story that maybe both of you can, you know, get something out of and, you know, maybe inspire you at least for this millisecond. And then you can go back to being whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Answer on that. <laughs> right. No, yeah. Going at each other or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. I, 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 it's moving for me just hearing your story. It's for those, those that listen, they never, they know I'm never lost for words and I'm lost for words a couple of times here because I don't even know where, where to go as we wrap things up. Because first off, thank you for coming on. Second off, your story is unbelievable. You know, you'll inspire our people. And I'm so happy we, we'd be able to have someone like you on because I, I just, this is, this is a treat. It really is. I'm lost for words. And, uh, you know, as we wrap things up, you know, a message from, from you, um, you know, of inspiration, uh, you've, you've said it all, you, you, you've talked through it, but I guess a message to our, our listeners and, and those out there that are struggling with, with their Everest and their descent and some things that some common terms some phrases that you use that you could fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. Having 10 years to really look back on my experience, you know, there's 300 bodies that are still on that mountain. And why am I alive? You know, I can deal with survivor's guilt all day long, but there is a purpose. And there's a purpose that we're all surviving. And I, I really feel for me to, you know, not to not panic. So figure out how to be, you know, calm and chaos, whatever the chaos is in our world. So we, you have to figure that out. Um, but what got me down was really faith and focus. You know, my faith, I've, I've had a miracle there. And I, I can't, you know. I never no one tried can debate it. No nope. one can debate it with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and plenty have tried. Um, and and focus. You know, I literally could not see, but I knew what it took to survive, and I never ever gave up. I was going to die trying. I had to figure out a way to take one more step forward. I love it. I love the passion. I love the focus. I love the consistency and the message. And it's interesting the faith talk because people will constantly challenge that, right? And that's, it's fair. They can, that's where we live in and that's their choice in their faith and whatever it may be, but it's really moving to hear, hear something like that. And it's inspirational. And Brian, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and I'm looking forward to circling back, staying in touch throughout the years, following your story. I know a ton of our followers will. So Brian Dickinson, really appreciate you coming on not for long media. Great. Thanks so much.